Hey, hello everyone. It looks like we are live. I'm gonna kind of check around to make sure things are looking okay, but I think they'll be fine. Yep, I think we're good. Okay, so welcome to the daily wrap up and Q&A for Bama Bug Fest on the web for Saturday, July 11th on our Bug Meets World, or Bug Meets World, A Walk in the Woods Day. We've been collecting all of your questions and comments about our content throughout the day. And we'll be asking our experts to see if we can get as many answers as possible. These daily wrap ups happen every day of Bama Bug Fest on the web at 7 p.m. and are always live. We're joined this evening by Dr. Megan Pimsler, an entomologist with the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Alabama. You might recognize her from one of our programs we had today. She's been kind enough to agree to come back this evening for a quick Q&A session. So thank you for coming back and joining us. Um, I can see your heart now. I know. <laughs> I know our segment that we had earlier was, um, it, it, I think it was deceptively live, which is good, um, mm -hmm. but it was a taped one. Um, so I can't really ask you how the segment went today because the magic of television made it happen another day. But um, how did you enjoy doing that segment when we filmed it? I had a great time. As you know, I love talking about insects and I like hanging out with you, so it was a lot of fun. We had a great time. And I mean, who doesn't love, taking a hike with great company and then just like flipping over a dead log, right? Only weirdos. <laughs> so um, today we had, as usual on Bugfest days, we had four times with con uh, content. So we had it at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and then now at 7. The one at 10 a.m. was a really great one with uh, Pam Sloan with Discovering Alabama. Pam was a teacher for over 30 years in the city school system, a science teacher, and she always has the best things to do. Um, I think you've met Pam on a couple of the other programs that we've done before. Yeah, she did the flower dissection, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so this time she brought us into the wonderful world of bug jars, which are super cool. And I've got mine right here, yeah, but they're mason that. jars. Yeah, they're really neat. So they're mason jars, and then you pop out the lid in the middle, and I've put a little bit of window screen on mine and yeah, glued it. Cool. So it's a nice little container. Um, Pam, because she's incredible and thrifty and recyclable and wonderful, she used... Um, she had some netting that she got on some produce and used that for a top for her oh. big terrarium. She also used, uh, she found some netting from, oh, um, a cuties bag, like mandarin oranges bag that okay. she used as a netting for the top. Um, and then she had, oh, um, some burlap and then some like cheesecloth that she used on the top too, which I thought was kind of neat. And oh. it was all just found items that she'd had from other things in her house, which oh. is one of my favorite parts about Pam. She's an excellent repurposer um for educational or uh, educational purposes yeah. but um she showed us that and she also showed us she's got these really wonderful magnifiers and like bug viewers and all this really cool stuff so she showed us um hers i showed her this one that i came across recently where it's a bug viewer that you can make at home with two plastic cups and you cut the bottoms off of them and you put cellophane or plastic wrap and then you tape yeah. it and then you put the bug gently in the bottom and like, and gently cover it. And so you have a viewer on both sides where oh, the bug God. is safe and you're safe, which I think is super cool and something yeah. that everyone can do at home. Yeah. Um, and then you just make sure to release your bug when you're done because bugs have got to breathe, you know, and they yeah. need to be in their, in their homes. So, but yeah, this is between those two. Um, this is a great, you know, for the most part, these types of materials are ones that you would have at home. And so they're great little activities that you can do yeah. together. Um, I also use mason jars to collect insects pretty often. They're great. Do you really? Oh, yeah. Especially the ones that have the, the separate lid pieces because insects need to breathe. So it's really great about how you can put the lid on and use something, paper towels or a piece of T-shirt or anything um, so that they can still breathe and you can take them with you or look at them before you let them go. See, more repurposing. We didn't talk about paper towels and t-shirts as options. That's great. <laughs> or bandanas or whatever you got lying around with you. Um, yeah, there's, so the other thing I will say that Pam introduced to me, introduced me to, I don't know if the, the world to, but to me at least, but yeah. she talked about bug hotels. Have you ever heard of these or bug boxes? Um, I've heard of bee hotels. I don't know if that's yeah. the same thing. 
I don't know. Let me show you some pictures. So I pulled up some pictures. Now it's just like a Google image search. So it's going to look real, you know, Google image searchy. But yeah. let me show you what I got. Look at these. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Aren't those the coolest? Those are pretty cool. So Miss Pam was showing us the beginnings of one of hers. And she had this crate that she got some produce and tomatoes or something in. Mm -hmm. And she used that crate as now it's going to be her bug hotel and she's putting it in her garden to help attract the beneficial bugs to her garden. Oh, um, and so she's, she was using a bunch of found items mm. that she had some, uh, what did she have? She had some packing material that she was using, like some paper packing material that she was using. She used some pine cones and some sticks oh. that she found and just a bunch of other nat natural like found. She said bamboo. If you have a chance to use bamboo, that those are really great because yeah. they've got, Oh, there's some right here with a bamboo. They've got yeah. the holes already in them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, these look like it's covered with Ritz crackers, but I know that it's not. Um, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I think little tree cookies or something. What I don't know. Yeah, I've never heard of a tree cookie. Oh, tree cookies like when you um, cut a slice out of a tree, like a trunk or a branch or something, and it's like a real thin slice. I see. I That's, see. Yeah, tree cookie. They are not as de well. They're delicious, I guess, to termites, but not to us. Okay. Um, but yeah, so these are bug hotels, and I had never heard of them before, but now I really want to build a bug hotel. So I have these heard of them. Um, oh, yeah? They're also called bee hotels. The tubes are thought to be really good for a lot of the solitary bees um, or wasps. Um, one caution I would give is that um, some of the things, there are predators of a lot of these beneficial insects as well. And so um, a lot of them hunt through sense of smell. And so it can be dangerous for the insects that are living in your bug hotel if you don't replace the material every year because that allows all the, the odors to build up that will make them easier to find for predators next year. And it can also mean that um, things that can make them sick can build up from year to year if you don't clean it out or have an open bag so that you can wash it. Um, that is very good to know. I did not know any of that. So I'm glad that you said it. Um, so now I will make sure you don't just set up a hotel and then just leave it forever. You have to maintain uh, the hotel, maintain the property. You, I mean, every place you live has maintenance, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's um, good to know. If it's all found stuff that you're finding in your yard, you could just empty it out, wash it, and then put new stuff in every year, um, which would be okay. totally easy. Um, okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. So if you liked the idea of the bug hotel and you saw it with, uh, with Miss Pam introducing it, um, please keep in mind what Megan just said, cause that's very important. <laughs> and and um, I don't want to discourage people from doing it cause it's a really yeah. good idea. Um, uh, it just requires slightly more. Effort. It's, it's not a set it and forget it situation. <laughs> You can forget it for like a whole year. So a it, whole year, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, you can't like plant a garden and then just next year it'll all grow again, right? You That's true. The <laughs> garden. So at the same time, as part of your like preparing your garden thing, you can make your <laughs> bee hotel again for this year. That's perfect. I like it. Um, okay, so. Um, again, and we mentioned it with Miss Pam's uh, segment too, but if you are interested in these like hikes and insects and, and forests and all those kind of things that we're talking about with Miss Pam and that we talked about with Megan and everyone else, Discovering Alabama is, the, is an incredible resource for it. 35 years, over 35 years of videos and more coming all the time. And um, if you go to discoveringalabama.org, all of their videos are available for free on their website, as well as teacher guides and resource guides for everyone. So please check them out. Discovering Alabama is an incredible program that have incredible people that work for it. And we would love for you to, to go and check them out. All right. So now let's get into our log flipping because I thought we just had such a good time. It was really hot though that day though. It was very it was hot. Food advisory. Um, yeah. Thing that we had water and we weren't out for that long. Yes. Um, but so we hiked for a little bit and then we found some really great logs to flip over. Yeah. And then you told me something that shook my world and changed my life. And that is that insect poop has a name. Yes. And I'm really excited oh. by it. And wow. the name is Frass. 
Yeah. And I didn't realize that insect poop had, I guess it, I mean, I mean, I know that everybody poops, right? So like I knew that insects pooped, obviously, but I just didn't know that there was like a name for it. Now I'm really excited. There's a name for it. Um, so I'm imagining that frass comes into entomological study often, right? It but can, definitely, yeah. Are there any entomologists that just study frass? Are there just like well, bug poop studiers? There are. Um, for a couple different reasons. The one that comes to mind most immediately is people who are studying bumblebees are concerned because it seems like bumblebees are dying out. And so they wanna know why this is happening. And one hypothesis is that um, the bees are dying out because they're catching diseases. And so mm -hmm. most of the time, how we test for diseases in insects is what's called a destructive process. We actually, unfortunately, have to kill the animal. And so- okay. You can imagine a situation where you're concerned about things dying out and the idea of killing them doesn't seem like it's going to help that, right? And right. so what this researcher has learned is that you can collect the bumblebee to a tube and then wait for her to poop and then let her go. And then you can test her poop for all the diseases that you were worried about and you never have to hurt her at all. You just have to wait for her frass. Um, and then you can test and you can look for diseases in that way. Um, and then flies can be a real nuisance in uh, especially uh, farms that have a lot of animals. And so this may be kind of gross, but flies, uh, go to the bathroom and throw up one or the other every time they land. And so researchers have learned that they can estimate how many flies are in a building by putting up little index cards and, after, and for a certain period of time, and then they count the number of, they call them fly spots, which makes it <laughs> a lot nicer than what it is. But they count <laughs> all the fly spots on the card and then they can estimate how many flies are, are in the, the fly house. Are in the that's, sorry, like the 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 barn, the air. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. I just feel like the more and more I learn about, I don't know, biology and and entomology, I just feel like it gets cooler and cooler. Like like my favorite fossils to find personally are the copper lights. I love the shark poopies and the mosasaur poopies. Yeah. They're my favorite ones to find. And so I just love that there's even more. I mean, obviously we're gonna study poop, but there's more study about poop, which is well, great. <laughs> Personally, uh, if I ever go caterpillar hunting, I know I can, you you want to look for the caterpillar frass first. Oh. Because caterpillars are really good at hiding, right? So you'll know that there's a caterpillar nearby if you can find their frass. And then you can search for them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so that's, that's lots of caterpillars that way. <laughs> I guess, I mean, as a caterpillar, like, what are you going to do? You're going to sit and eat and it's going to move through you and you're going to poop. So there's going to be a lot of it to find, right? Caterpillars can eat so much. It's insane how much <laughs> a caterpillar eats. I mean, realistically. So I caught a luna moth once and she laid eggs. And then I decided I was going to grow all these babies up and, and release a bunch of luna moths. And... You know, at the beginning, they're so tiny, like you practically need a microscope to see them. And by the time they're fully grown, they're bigger around than your thumb and they're like this long and they oh go gosh. through so many leaves. I, I was worried I had to cut down a whole tree to feed them. They have to pupate soon. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> were there, did you have to find certain types of leaves for them or were they just, yeah. just looking for food? Um, very few insects will eat just anything out there. They're, most of them have uh, either favorites or like they can only eat this one thing. And so okay. um, luna moths, uh, the caterpillars seem to be able to eat a couple different kinds of plants. Uh, I was able to get access to pecan trees and they really yeah. like pecan leaves. Uh, but sweet okay. gum is also very popular with... Um, the, the moths. They need to have some sort of leaf, like, um, oh, what's that thing called where you you rent restaurant or you rate restaurants? Yelp. They need a like a, a leaf yeah. Yelp for caterpillars. <laughs> like, well, for, for people who study uh, insects, it can be very important to know what they like. Like I study bumblebees, right? And so 
bumblebees only like certain kinds of flowers. Bumblebees don't go to all flowers. Like if I see a bunch of white flowers, I know that mostly what I'm going to find there are flies and I'm not going to find any bees at all. So when I'm out looking for bumblebees, I'm looking especially for blue and purple flowers because bumblebees really seem to like blue and purple flowers. That, I mean, they're gorgeous. Those are great colors for flowers. So <laughs> they've got good taste, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think you had mentioned not to go back to the poop thing, but we're going to go back to the poop thing That's real quick. Um, I got off topic. Sorry. I want to talk about poop more. No, but I think you had mentioned uh, to me before that there were some kind of funny books, maybe. And I, I hadn't heard of them before, but did you have some funny books you were telling me about? Yeah, I've, got, I've got two books. Um, so the one that's relevant to Pooh, sort of, only because of the title, is called True or Pooh. Um, so Danny Rabiotti and Nick Caruso were both PhD students, and they met on Twitter. And they, re they wrote their first book, which I have read, which is um, Does It Fart? based on some conversations that they had on Twitter. So Nick Caruso actually did his PhD at the University of Alabama, which is how I know him. And Danny cool. is um, over in the UK. I can't remember what university she's at. Um, and so they wrote this book and actually Does It Fart was the first one they did. It was a New York Times bestseller. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Ethan Kosak, I hope I pronounced that correctly, did the um, illustrations for it also, I think a grad student. Um, and so this, what they did was they looked at the science of flatulence, what produces the gas in your, in a body and the anatomy and to determine either whether science knows for a fact that animals fart, like in cows, we know that they fart. Um, and anybody who's owns a dog knows that they um, <laughs> And then like snakes, could a snake fart? Right? Like, does it have the musculature to be able to fart? Does it have, the, does it eat the right kinds of things or, or stuff like that? And so uh, every uh, open, like two pages is an illustration. And these, look at that illustration. I mean, that's amazing. That's um, great. <laughs> so every page has an illustration and then a description of the science that they looked into to figure out if this animal would fart or not. That's, I think... Not being, you know, this is just the cover, but my favorite part about them is like the disgruntled yeah. neighbor fish. Yeah, right? And, and that one fish looks so fine with what he's doing. Yeah, he's just, I mean, yeah, things happen, you know? And, and then... Or poo is, um, it's not just about about feces. It's not only... Yeah, from full of feces. That's really, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever heard of either. Again, I'm a, the expressiveness of these illustrations, I think are my favorite. I cannot wait to find these books so I can look inside. Um, okay. One of our partners for this event is the Tuscaloosa Public Library. And I don't know if these are there, but if you guys are interested in them, the first place to look to see if they're there or not, I think should be the Tuscaloosa Public Library. Mm -hmm. These books are really great. I've given them to some friends uh, and I plan to give them to my niece when she's not six months old. <laughs> it's probably good i think the answer to does it fart for your niece is probably yes <laughs> at the moment oh, it definitely does My <laughs> is, uh, and I, I won't mention her name so maybe she won't be embarrassed that's fine i'm just kidding <laughs> if it my um i'm pretty sure my cat does too because uh, i've been mm -hmm. around it and it's so, uh, um snakes fart do they really yeah yeah <laughs> it's pretty good it's pretty um, good. Yeah. Um, all right. So I guess we can stop talking about pooping and farting, but I'm glad that we had that great conversation and say in little sideways tangent about pooping and farting. <laughs> but um, it does it and you can actually learn a lot from it. Um, uh, there are some public health people that are studying wastewater to see what we can tell about the health um, of populations, right? So they'll go to a city wastewater plant and actually um, they've done some studies and uh, you can detect viruses in the wastewater before people start coming into hospitals sick with diseases. So uh, our poo is very important too. <laughs> Everybody poos and it's important. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you and I were walking around and doing our hike, um, we saw one of my favorite parts was we saw several different logs, but in different stages of decomposition. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my favorite things that you talked about was um, and you, you talked about it in the in the video, too. But 
was the idea that even fallen logs can be a part of this like idea of succession, right? And I've mostly heard the term succession, like you mentioned, with forests and how forests mm -hmm. grow after a, you know yeah. a, a large event, a traumatic event to the forest. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was really interesting to think about those logs in terms of succession too, because like you said, you know, when they just first fall over, they're still pretty hard, mm -hmm. and so things that can't handle tough fibrous wood material wouldn't be able to do anything with it at that time. It'd have to wait for it to break down a little bit more, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it really requires something with very strong jaws. Um, although I will say I was thinking about our discussion later. And so um, there are some beetles that attack living trees and uh, a certain kind of beetle, these pine beetles, one of the things that they do is they have this fungus that they carry around with them. They have these special body parts to like grab fungal spores and hold onto them and they bring them with them to the new tree. And that's part of what helps them to uh, attack and eat the tree is bringing this, this disease with them that attacks the tree and helps them break things down and control the tree's response to them. Because trees kind of have an immune system, plants do, to insects eating them. So trees, yeah. for example, will produce a bunch of sap and so that's one of the things that can prevent insects from attacking them. Um, and uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, one of my favorite facts about insects and plants is that caterpillars eat leaves, right? Um, a lot of yeah. caterpillars eat leaves. And so um, trees respond to that, plants respond to that. One of the things they do is they release chemicals that tells other plants nearby hey, I'm being attacked by insects. And those other nearby plants will actually start to produce chemicals to protect them from the insects. But even cooler than that, um, the saliva of the insect will mix with the liquids of the plants when the insects chew open the cells. And it will produce an odor that's specific to that kind of insect and that stage of life that will attract a predator for that insect. So Whoa. The, different ages of the insect or different kinds of insects that are eating the plant, different um, predators will be attracted um, to attack the plant. So the plant is calling out for help. That's so incredible. <laughs> so the, and I've heard about the, the um, <laughs> wide network of plant like warning systems, I guess. I'm trying to figure out, but I've, I've heard about that, but I didn't know about the saliva thing. That's the coolest yeah. thing ever. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Uh, I got a topic of trees again. Yes, but trees are an excellent, I think, uh, microcosmos of succession, right? It's a, yeah. a process that takes time and you can see changes in what's on the tree and what the tree looks like over time. Um, the other thing that uses succession is forensic entomology, which is when we use insects to estimate how long something has been dead. Um, and so when an animal dies, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's the circle of life, right? Like those nutrients get broken down. And so there are different kinds of insects that you can find at different times um, after death. Um, and, and that can also be informative. So we can see succession in a lot of different things. You can see it in ponds, um, the way that they change over time. Um, I mean, if you don't mow your lawn for a really long time, you could see it in your yard. <laughs> <laughs> or you could go on a hike and flip a log. Exactly. See it there. <laughs> um, okay, that's really cool. So we have had a um, couple of comments and questions from some of the viewers, and I thought maybe I could just run them by you to see what you think. That's all right I with you? You're my best. Okay, so this is one, it's, an, it's not, um, exactly about anything we had talked too much about today, but it's related to bugs. And so somebody said that they were seeing a bunch of flies in their house recently, and they were wondering if that was like a thing that's happening. Is it something that's just this time of year? Is there a reason that it happens? And then they also asked if there was a way that they could help get rid of them because they're having a real hard time. <laughs> well, it kind but, of depends on what kind of flies that they are. Um, I myself had a fruit fly outbreak in my house um, and so fruit flies actually are attracted to fruit and things that are decomposing, much like the logs were. And so um, I went and I looked for any fruit that was in my house that was going bad. And because they're attracted to decomposing things, and one of the byproducts of decomposition is vinegar and alcohol, 
um, which is produced by yeast, you can make a simple trap for them, which is a small jar with some vinegar or yeast in it, and then a little bit of oil. And so the insects will be attracted to it. And then they, the oil um, has a surface tension that they will get sucked into and they can't get out of. Unlike water, because they're so small, they could just float on top and then leave. If you've ever seen a water strider, like that, this water surface tension is what they're using. So you'd need to add soap or something that would reduce the, the surface tension and oil is another way that the, the, the scent will leave so the insects will come to it. Um, other things that can cause flies, well, it's getting really hot outside. So it's pretty common for insects to come indoors during changes in seasons or rapid changes in temperature. And it's not like they're, oh, well, they know that there's air conditioning, but they're trying to get under something or in something cool, like a log or under a rock or whatever. And unfortunately, I think from an insect's point of view, a house is just a big, you know, log or rock. Big log, yeah, exactly. <laughs> with, so the, all, with the huge hole in the middle or yeah <laughs> exactly and then you know occasionally animals will die um near some place and uh flies especially use their sense of smell to find food mm. and so okay. uh you'll end up with a situation where a bunch of flies are looking for food and your garbage can has you know bones in it or remains of your dinner or leftovers from making food and and that'll be decomposing in your trash can and even though you can't smell it they can it's a, an attractive opportunity for them mm, yeah. decomposing food <laughs> um so at four o'clock today we had this great video called you light up my life flashy fireflies oh. and um Yes, good. And the Abbots, Kendra and John Abbott, who are um, mm -hmm. an ecologist and an entomologist, um, did this great video on fireflies and some things that are like not fireflies, but look like fireflies and can be ex confused for fireflies. So it was really neat. But somebody was asking, so they talked about some of the places that fireflies are found, like in Alabama, and they talked about, I think, some of the ones in Texas and a few other places. But somebody asked if, if somebody knew where else fireflies could be found, are they just something that's here, like in the Southeast? I mean, I guess I've seen them in Ohio too, so they can be, yeah. but are they just something that's found here in North America? No, uh, fireflies are found on every continent worldwide, except Antarctica. There are insects <laughs> in Antarctica, but they're not fireflies. Um, and I think <laughs> like 2,000 species. Of oh, wow. 2,000, I can't remember. I, I may be off by a zero, but there's lots of species. And you can find incredible videos of some of the species in like Thailand and stuff where they will all flash. They have synchronized flashing where all the insects will flash at the same time instead of flashing whenever on their schedule. Um, so there can be some really uh, spectacular firefly demonstrations. I mean, fireflies cool. are, are super interesting. Um, you know, most of their life, they're they're larvae. Um, they're mm -hmm. babies, not adults. And the flash is uh, a way for the males and the females to communicate. Uh, <laughs> and um, some fireflies will actually eat other fireflies. So the female will learn the flashes of a different species and they'll trick the males of the other species into coming over because of response and then she'll she'll eat them. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, it's opportunistic. You're learning from your environment. <laughs> Those same fireflies have also been seen stealing. They're, I think that they're just, um, They've been they've been observed stealing food out of spider webs. So I think that they're yeah. just uh, some real serious fireflies. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they sound to be very um, brave. <laughs> yes, that's yes, that's what very doing. brave. <laughs> um, okay, well that's cool. That's good to know. And I think hopefully that answers the question from our visit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. One more firefly thing. So fireflies, um, some of them are chemically protected. And one of the chemicals that allows them to light up, because it's a chemical reaction, is, uh, or no, sorry, it's the chemical that's chemically protective, is lucibufagin, which I think is just a really fun word to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Uh, that's one of my favorite things, I think, is, is scientific names of things when you find them and they just feel 
perfect or fun to say, or there's way too many consonants together or just too many syllables together. And I just love them. Yeah. Well, so the loose loop again comes from like Lusa, Lucifer, sort of like light morning star kind of a thing. And then Bufo are the cane toads, which are poisonous. And so a lot of toads have these poisons on them. And so yeah. I don't know why an entomologist was like, I know what's perfect. I'm going to take <laughs> two very different things and put them together into one word to describe a third totally other thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that either. That's okay. You know, I wonder if they even knew the answer. Maybe they just like those words. You know, yeah, we'll stick the words together. So um, sometimes entomologists get into fight with each other. And there's this yeah. kind of well-known one where, so people who describe insects get to name them. And these two entomologists really didn't like each other. And one of them named an insect after the other. And then when he was later asked about why he would honor this person who was kind of his enemy, he said, I named the ugliest insect I have ever seen after him. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> the shade of it all. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of those stories, I think, of like, like even in paleontology, when you go into like the bone wars and stuff, you know, like there's a lot of these oh, stories of like competing scientists and competing researchers. And they are, I think, maybe not as well known stories, but they're interesting once you get into them. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. scientists are people too. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, so we got one more that popped up. And then um, so you can show you. I don't know. I'm not sure. I've not heard too much of them, but. Someone asked if we had two seasons of tomato hornworms. Okay. Do you know um, what those are? I do know what tomato hornworms are. They are okay. mentexta. They are actually a pretty common study organism, but they're the big green caterpillars with the horn, the red horn. Oh, on it. yeah. Um, I actually crocheted my duca sexta, but I don't know where it is, and I don't want us to, if I, I, I should have been more prepared. Um, as for whether they're, <laughs> seasons of them. So some insects will only lay eggs once a year. Other insects will lay eggs like the adults when they're ready and it doesn't matter the time of year. And so I believe that tobacco hornworm caterpillars, that's also what they're known as, or tomato hornworm caterpillars, that they will lay eggs throughout the year. That There's no okay. single time of year that they lay eggs. Okay. Thank you. And that one is one that came live to us in the comments. So oh, okay. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leah, for that question. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I have seen your crocheting before. You were an excellent insect crocheter. If you have seen, well, we had a, we did a pollination thing for um, museums from your home and you got to show us your life cycle of the bee crochet. And it was life cycle. Yes. It was, it's delightful. It's wonderful. I mean, if you um, one minute, I know where I could go look for it. I could go look for it if you want me to. If you want to, yeah, I can, I'll pull you out of this and I'll do a little talking. Okay. I'll be back in one second. Okay. okay. So um, we, today has been a really great day. Um, it's all about hiking in the woods and, and finding insects in the woods. Um, it's one of the things that was mentioned in the two o'clock show, which was the, um, flipping over a log one with Dr. Pimsler, she mentioned a, a website that we've talked about a lot. It's a website and an app called iNaturalist. And so um, let me pull up this great website here. So iNaturalist is a citizen science initiative um, that is, is run by the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic Society. And it's a place where if you have a picture of something that you found and you're not quite sure what it is, or even if you are sure what it is, but want to take part in the citizen science project, you can upload this picture to this website or to the app if you would like to download that for your phone. And you can help it, you can get it identified if you're not sure what it is or help identify it for others. And then there's also, you know, in doing so, you help um, extend the knowledge of that area, what insects are a part of that and um, help, you know, scientists and researchers have a better understanding of what um, the insects look like in a certain area. So check out iNaturalist. It's a great website. It's a lot. It's a wonderful thing that's easy and free to use. Um, and you can use it all the time. And once you get start meeting people that are on it all the time, and they're great and wonderful people. 
So it sounds like, oh, it looks like we found it. Did you find it? Yes, we did. Okay. Um, iNaturalist isn't just insects, though. I know that this is Bama Bug Fest, but. Um, oh, that's true. For plants. A year when it's not just bugs, plants, insects, vertebrates, which, you know, um, bugs rule, vertebrates rule, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so this but one. all all things nature. Oh, my gosh. It's huge. Oh, I didn't tell you that, did I? <laughs> that's all. Oh. So I knew you crocheted so, that. I crocheted that. You knitted that. I uh, crocheted it. So it's just crocheted. Little, it. Okay. But I uh, there's this little face. I even gave it the the simple eyes. You can see them right over here. I gave it its little lip. It's got some legs. And so yeah. So this is my tobacco hornworm caterpillar. And it's, it's so, so sweet. <laughs> so now that you know, for those who are watching this and weren't sure what those are, I am immediately like, oh, I've seen those before. Now yeah. I know what you're talking about. Exactly. So hopefully this will help put that question into context some more. How long did that project take you? I this kind of putting you on the spot, but yeah, um, about a month. I mean, you know, okay. my job isn't crocheting, so I couldn't just sit and crochet. That's all day. true. <laughs> um, this is actually a pattern that I found online, and there are lots of insect patterns that you can find that are anatomically accurate insects. So that's cool. um, I added a couple of details. Oh, thank you, Leah. I added. <laughs> couple of details uh, myself that weren't a part of the original pattern um but yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> um that is thank you so much for finding him that's wonderful <laughs> um well, oh one more one that just popped up real quick in the live comments was somebody okay. just found out that gypsy moths are a pest in their neighborhood in your neighborhood are there any thoughts on the gypsy moth do you have any thoughts on them do you know much about them? Are a pest. Um, <laughs> so, uh, gypsy moths are actually pretty bad for um, deciduous trees, and because at least in Alabama, one of the top three um, uh, industries in Alabama is timber. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's actually really important that we keep an eye out for them um, and do what we can in our own yards to try and control them. Um, so I think gypsy moths are also known as tent caterpillars. Um, they'll make those big or web worms potentially. Um, it can be hard because while entomologists have approved common names, which is not the species name, but like these are the only ways you're allowed to describe this kind of insect. Um, it's, if you're not an entomologist, you may have a, a different word for it. Um, but they can clear uh, whole trees, right? So like the, the larvae will live together in a big clump and then they'll all go out and eat and then come back to their tent. Um, so they can be a real problem. And actually, uh, gypsy moths are uh, invading. So I, you may or may not have heard about all that murder hornet nonsense um, <laughs> up in Washington, but at the same time that the media was getting very concerned about the murder hornets, um, the gypsy moths were moving in. And in Washington state where apples and uh, cherries and other things that grow on deciduous trees are grown a lot, plus they have a lot of timber and trees, um, gypsy moths are a real problem because they can spread and if people don't know to keep an eye out for them, it can be very hard for, for the state departments of forestry to, to keep an eye on them and control them. I mean, realistically, things like iNaturalist or some of these, you know, there are lots of programs for looking for different, the seven spotted ladybug or other kinds of things are, are it's vital that uh, people that aren't just the scientists are involved because, you know, scientists are one person. You can only be in one place. And a lot of scientists study things that aren't directly where they live. And so having partners in the community who are able and willing to keep an eye out is so important. Okay. That's great. So, and I think that might bring me to my next one. Um, I think that kind of segues in perfectly. But you mentioned in the video, you mentioned um, a group that, in case people were really into yeah. insects, that they might want to check out. Yeah. And that group was the Entomological Society of America, right? The Entomological Society of America. So as I'm sure everyone is tired of hearing, entomology is the scientific study of insects. And so the Entomological Society of America are um, both professional and hobbyist entomologists, uh, people with any level of education, 
Um, we've got pe people who work for governments, who work for universities, who work for insect zoos. Um, it's one of the largest professional um, entomological scientific organizations in the world. We have over 7,000 members. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you've got questions about insects, we, uh, there's Facebook, I think there's a Facebook page. I know that there's a Twitter, um, and uh, and and we do a lot to try and get information out about insects to um, everyone else because you know we're a service society. We want to talk about insects and share about them. So if you have questions about bugs, this is a great website. Um, if you're looking for an entomologist in your area because you've got a question about something particular, you can contact them. Um, I mean, I'm a member, so if you feel more comfortable because you know me, you can contact me. Um, I think Twitter might be the easiest, uh, at please bug me. <laughs> and I'm gonna put it up on the screen, at please bug, but all of it spelled out, right? Or yes. spelled out all the way? Okay. I'm gonna put that up so everyone can see it. No problem. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's me. Okay. So you can contact me. <laughs> and I can find something for you if uh, if uh, you'd rather reach out to me instead of the uh, ESA, the Entomological Society of America. I I am so happy that you got that name on Twitter. I know, right? Oh, it's my like, God. We had um, a, an arachnologist that came to help us on Tuesday, and his, uh, um, his handle is Spider Day Night Live. It's it's all so, it's so all of you are genius. <laughs> anyway, um, but okay, great. So it sounds like everyone has got a lot of great, wonderful resources to have if they were in them. Um, now we know that there are crocheting patterns of accurate anatomical insects all around in the world. Um, and we are just you can have your own. You can have your own. And we are just you know, all full up of, of great bugs on a on a walk on the trail in the woods facts, which is great. Um, Can I just so, thank you and uh, the other was doing natural history for doing stuff like Bama Bug Fest? I mean, oh. I mean, it, as an entomologist, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, bugs are so gross, ooh, bugs, you know, and they, it's so gratifying to have people be excited about them too, and not just as bug nerds. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. We um, could not do it without the help of all the all of you guys. So thank you. It's, it sounds like we have a pretty good partnership going on. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, okay. So make sure that everyone checks out those sites that um, uh, Megan talked about. Make sure everyone talks or checks out Discovering Alabama at discoveringalabama.org. Yeah. And um, I want to thank you again for joining us for Bama Bug Fest on the web. Make sure to check us out on Tuesday, July 14th for our Water Bugs Day. I'm really looking forward to that day. They're one of my favorite types of bugs. Yeah, water bugs are great. Water bugs are so cool. Um, and so content always appears at uh, 10, 2, 4, and 7, and all times are Central Standard Time. If you aren't able to join us for the live presentations at the times that they happen, you can always go back and watch them later through the archived videos on our social media sites or YouTube channels, or through our handy resource guide that you can find at our website, bamabugfest.org. As always, we want to thank the UA Museums, Mildred Webster Brought Warner uh, Transportation Museum, Alabama Museum of Natural History, Department of Research and Collections, UA Rogers Library, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library for all of your work in organizing this event. And thank you to you, Dr. Pemsler, for joining us today and helping us out. We really appreciate you sharing a little bit of your time and expertise with us today. So thank you. Um, for everyone that's watching, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of our um, event partners, social media channels and YouTube pages, um, social media pages and YouTube channels. I got those wrong. <laughs> and um, make sure to visit us at Bama Bug Fest on the web. Oh, one more thing before I forget. Don't forget that we are still having our art contest. You can find the submission form on this website, bamabugfest.org, and that there is a virtual exhibit that is up and running that has to do with behind the scenes for um, 
nature and insect photography for some some students from ua so make sure you check that out too actually if you saw um the firefly video today kendra abbott was the instructor for that class so you'll see her there and you'll get to recognize her name so make sure you see that all of that is available on bamabugfest.org as well as a full schedule of events for the entirety of the event all right i think i've said enough I hope everyone has a great night and thank you for joining us for another segment of Bama Bug Fest on the web. Good night, everyone. Night.